Friday, thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and it's time for our weekly Bible study. And today we are going to be studying Job chapter 9 and Job's question about what do you do when God is so great? But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words, and on Fridays I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk, and then I publish two videos a week. I publish a replay of that Bible study as well as a video about books. So if you are interested in either of those things, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, be sure to hit the bell for notifications so you can get updates about new videos. So we've been in the middle of the book of Job, and we, I think this is lesson eight, that what we've done, and uh, if you would like to go through the Bible study start to finish, and you haven't seen the other ones, you can go to my website at racetowalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies, and click on study book of Job, and you will see a list of all the lessons that are there, along with a little brief synopsis of what they're about. So, the book of Job, um, I don't know about you, I have uh, read it, I don't know how many times I've heard sermons on it, but going through it this, this time has really been a little bit different, and I think it's because I am really focusing in depth on a single chapter and go through it verse by verse that it's given me a little bit of a different perspective on it, and I think we always need to keep our, um, our mind open to the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes we have some ideas about the context of a particular passage because that's the way it's been taught to us. And that I don't think is always true, right? And so when I do these Bible study, I do look at different commentaries. I do research the different positions of what people think. Sometimes I don't always agree with them. I've seen some uh, sermons and teachings that I really think that they've missed uh, big parts of the reading. So this is the thing. You may not agree with my presentation on this, and that's fine. We can have a discussion about that, and um, you know, be feel free to share you know, your thoughts and what you, you see in these passages. But before we get started, let's just start this time with a prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this day and for this time. We invite in the presence of your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. Give us eyes that can see you clearly. Give us ears that can hear your voice. Give us a heart that is willing to seek after you. I plead the blood of Jesus over each person that listens, and I rebuke every single thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I am not going to do a blow-by-blow -blow overview of what we've gone over so far, but we are going to do a little bit of a brief overview. So in the first part of the book of Job, we find out who Job is. We find out his position. Um, and a little bit about his family, and we see a little bit behind the curtain about what is going on uh, kind of in this unseen world concerning him, and then we find out what happens to him. So he had it all, and then he lost everything. And then after this, you know, Job is understandably completely crushed. He's utterly despondent. He's just in complete despair. Three of his friends come to comfort him. And regardless of what you think about what their, his friends have to say, I think it's important to keep in mind that these were friends that came. So Job, I'm sure, had tons of friends when he was the wealthiest man in the area. But when the, the bottom came down in his life, there were only three people that came to comfort him. So we may disagree with some of the things that they said. We may uh, say, oh, I would never do this, but... Um, I think this is the important thing to remember. So in chapter 3, this is Job's first response before his friends have said anything, that he can't see anything else. And so both of his friends tell him, go to God. Go to God. He is the one that can vindicate you. He is the one that can restore you and redeem you. Go present peace to him. Go and ask God. And after his friends' advice, we see that Job does begin to do that. The fact that his friends are there, it, in a way, draws Job out of himself, rather than focus being on himself and his problems and what he's lost, he, in, in having his friends there and interacting with them, that starts to draw him out of himself and look outward, right? And in this lesson, we see that he begins to look up. He begins to, he doesn't come to a place yet where he's really positioning God, in, this, in chapter 9, he begins to put his focus on God. We're going to start reading in chapter 9, and this is Job's response to Bildad, and Bildad, if we remember from last week, has 
given words of encouragement to Job and really given him a, a prophecy for his life that his later days will be greater than his former days. And he's really encouraged him that, you know, go, go and ask God if you're righteous. If you're not at fault and, and you've done nothing to deserve what's happened to you, go to God and, and ask him to help you. And this is the thing. So we're going to see what the, what the what Job's response is and what his hang-up still is. And I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard for most of the passage. So then Job answered, In truth, I know that this is so, but how can a man be right before God? So both Eliphaz and Bildad have said, Go to God if you're righteous. And Job is uh, has a clear kind of conscience about his actions. But the thing is, he, he realizes that no one can be truly righteous before God. I mean, he has been, uh, we saw in chapter one, that Job had been acting basically as high priest to atone for any unintentional sins on the part of his family. So he, of all people, knows that we can go right, we can even unwittingly violate God's laws. He knows this because he's made a practice of supplicating God and giving offerings to God in atonement for the sins of his family. Okay, now we're going to read in verse 3. If one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him once in a thousand times, wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has defied him without harm? In these verses, Job begins to describe the magnificence and the majesty of God. God is so great. Who is Job? Who is Job to have even be noticed by God, let alone have a conversation with him? Like, who is he that he could even begin to approach the Almighty God? So as we're reading through this, uh, let Job's words paint a picture in your mind of what he's describing here. Verse 5, it is God who removes the mountains, they know not how. When he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun not to shine and sets the seal upon the stars. This stanza is another one that is really interesting to compare translations. So let's look at how Young's literal translation translates this. I've mentioned this in Bible studies a few times before. This is a translation that was published in 1898. It's very... Um, it's a formal equivalence translations. It's more word for word. What I really like about it is that um, if it's the choices between relaying the more of the literalness of the translation versus making it a smoother read, they'll stay with the literalness. And what they really, what I really like about it is that they're very faithful in translating like verb tenses. So you see kind of the action, I think, a little bit more in Yang's literal translation than you do others. I've never seen a print copy of this, this book. You can, if you have the, the uh, new version by lab, you, you can get it on there. That's usually how I see it or any of the Bible study websites like uh, Bible Gateway and Blue Letter Bible and Study Light. They'll have this translation as an option to look at. But let's read this. Verse 5. Who is removing mountains and they have not known? Who hath overturned them in his anger? Who is shaking earth from its place and its pillars move themselves? Who is speaking to the sun and it rises not and the stars he sealeth up? In these verses, Job is saying, God is the one who moves mountains and who is shaking the earth and who is speaking to the sun. And these verbs are all in the present participle. So this is active and ongoing. This is a continuous process. So Job is is acknowledging that God is active and present and working in the world. He just doesn't think that God will pay attention to him. The verse where it says, God is the one who is removing mountains. And now this is, we hear it like this references to, you know, straightening the past, leveling, leveling the past, you know, removing obstacles. Usually it, it's kind of a, a way to say God is, is removing the obstacles in your path. It will make your way straight. The other verse where this is a very clearly references this same imagery is in Zechariah 4 6, where the prophet Zechariah is giving a word to Zerubbabel, who has been tasked with rebuilding the temple. And this is 
Zechariah 4, 6. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. So Zechariah is faced with an overwhelming task, but God said, Don't worry about it. I will make your way straight. I will remove the mountain in front of you. You trust in me, and you just move forward. Basically, what God is telling him is to have faith. We've talked about this a few times in uh, my discussion with Donald Williams um, on his book, The 95 Theses for Your Reformation, and also in the sermon by George MacDonald on uh, faith, the, the proof of the unseen. Faith isn't just having an idea and thinking something would be great. It's, as Donald Williams describes it, it's a trust that commits. So you trust in what God is saying, and you commit to that and move forward. And that's the exact same thing that George MacDonald says in his sermon. So he's saying, I've given you this task. You move forward, and I will clear the way for you. That's this illustration. This is also reminiscent of what Jesus says to his disciples. Uh, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. In Job, Job is saying, God is the one who moves mountains. In Zechariah, we see this partnership between man and God, right? He said, I'm going to make the way straight. You move forward. And then when Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he is, you know, in Christ, we are given you know, authority, right? And he's saying, as God's representative, if you say this, this this is what will happen. You will be moving mountains. The next thing I want to talk about is just the setting of Job. And like I said, um, we've, we've talked a few times, and there's, there's a debate about when the dating of Job, but I agree with the scholars that think that Job was written about the time of the patriarchs. And, you know, if so, Egypt would have been the world power at the time. And their gods and beliefs would have been the dominant uh, beliefs of the culture, right? And so, when we read verse 7, and where it says that God, who is, who is speaking to the Son, is also, it can also be translated as who is commanding the Son. We, as moderns in the 21st century, would probably have in our mind this idea of, you know, this object in space and that, you know, God orders it in a way that, you know, he created the world and set the physical laws in place. And in that way, he orders and commands the, these planets, right? But if this is set 4,000 years ago, in the ancient Near East, that's not how they would have seen it. And the Egyptians, it's their, they had their own pantheon of gods. And we talked a little bit about this in, um, I can't remember, I think it was in our one year chronological Bible study that when the beliefs about gods in the Old Testament was they were local, right? And so when a country won a war, it was believed it was because their gods were stronger than the opposing side's gods. And so Egypt was the reigning power in the area, and so their gods were seen as supreme, right? And so their main god, which is the, the kind of the form and the story kind of changes a little bit over time, um, but, you know, Ra was known as the sun god. It's also known as Ammon or Ammon, Ra or Re. And he was the supreme god of Egypt. And Job is saying that his god commands the sun. And then also, on this same section, Ra was believed to have created the stars and the four pillars, which the four pillars were pillars that were believed to hold up the heavens. And the stars were believed to be like beings, or um, I read one um, description of it, that they were believed to be ministers of Ra. So Ra was believed to have created them, and they were his ministers. And But according to Job, his god, seals up those stars. So he commands the sun, which is Ra. He's shaking the earth. The pillars of the heavens are being moved. And he seals up the stars. So all of these things are um, 
play very important roles into Egyptian beliefs. So it would be like, try to, try to think of something that would it just even be in a comparison. It would be like, I don't know that we really have anything like that. Um, I was just reading a little bit about 9-11 yesterday with the building collapse in Florida, you know, they, and they're still doing you know, search and recovery. I want to see like how long, how long after, um, the collapse at 11 that they found somebody. But anyway, I was watching what happened. And the reason that the attack was on that, it was because that was the center, center of our finance and our commerce. And then Flight 93 was, I think it was headed towards the White House. And then the other flight was at the Pentagon, right? And that's our military. So it's our commerce, our government, our military. Those are the, the three symbols of, that they went after to attack. This, the words of Job are kind of like his version of 9-11. He's attacking all the main symbols of the Egyptians. Yeah, let's go down to verse 8. Who alone stretches out the heavens and tramples down the waves of the sea. So I looked in the net full note study Bible. I'll link to it in the description if you're interested. In it. It's really great to have, like, if you want to know some of the discussion and debate on different translations that has a ton of it, especially here in Job, a lot of, a lot of discussion in notes. Now the commentator on this weighs in on this verse and it says that he, whoever the writer of the commentary was, thinks that it probably was simply referring to the literal waves of the sea. But then it says a little bit further under that, that there's a view that attributes this is a reference to Canaanite mythology. The marginal note in the RSV has the back of the sea dragon. The view would also see in the sea the Agardic god Yamu. I think that that's probably true. I mean, he's already addressing this god superiority over the Egyptian gods. That just makes sense to me, and it would fit that um, he's also addressing the other the pantheons of the surrounding nations too. Let's go down to uh, verse 9. Who makes the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. So this is referring to constellations. I'm going to link in the description a bunch of links about these constellations and some of the myths about them. And I'm sure there's more of a connection to verse 9. I'll just be honest with you. I spent a whole lot of time just researching the mythology of the ancient Near East when I was doing this. So I'm, I know that there are references here, but you can probably write a book just on this single verse alone. But again here... You know, he's saying that, that God made, Yahweh made, the bear of Orion and the Pleiades. And this is something that Job is saying Yahweh did that Amun-Ra had said that he did. So again, this is kind of a confrontation here, right? Verse 10. Who does great things unfathomable and wondrous works without number? Were he to pass by me, I would not see him. Were he to move past me, I would not perceive him. Were he to snatch away, who could restrain him? Who could say to him, what are you doing? Now, in this, Job is differentiating his God from all the pagan gods. So the gods of Egypt and you know, all the ones that were around at the time, they took a human or humanish form, and they walked among men. You know, pharaohs were believed to be their descendants. You know, They could be seen. They could be challenged. And you know, in the war of the evil, they were... Um, the outcome was kind of uncertain sometimes. So they were supreme and all po and powerful, but they weren't really all powerful, right? So Job in this verse is describing God as immaterial, um, yet ever present. He's all powerful, and his judgment cannot be questioned or challenged. So verse thirteen, God will not turn back his anger. Beneath him crouch the helpers of Rahab. If you're reading this, you probably have in your mind Rahab, the one who helped the spies, you know, uh, Confer Confer Jericho, right? That's not that. Um, so again, the Net Full of Study Bible provides some clarification on this reference. This is from that comment. Rahab is not to be confused with the harlot of the same name from Jericho. Rahab is identified with Tiamat of the Babylonian creation epic or Leviathan of Canaanite myths. It is also used in parallelism to the sea in chapter 26, 12, or the Red Sea, Psalm 74, 13, and so comes to symbolize Egypt in Isaiah 37. 
In the Babylonian creation epic, there is a reference to the helper of Tiamat. In the Bible, the reference is only to the raging sea, which the Lord controlled at creation. So, again, now we're hit, hitting a Babylonian creation myth, right? So, don't, wouldn't you think that that other that they thought just referred to the sea probably refers to the other ideas about um, who actually is responsible for creating and ordering the world, right? And I think all of these references make it really clear that Job is proclaiming the sovereignty of Yahweh over all of the other gods, that he is supreme, the greatest of all. But then we come to the dilemma. And like I said, the Egyptians believe that Ra was the supreme and most powerful. He wasn't technically omnipotent or all-powerful. And the Egyptian priests actually performed daily rituals to curse Apep, which was the serpent god, or uh, he's a god of darkness and evil in the Egyptian pantheon. And he was Ra's enemy. So they believe that the daylight was Ra driving his chariot across the sky in darkness was when Apep, the snake, came into power. So they had to curse Apep each day to make sure that the next day would come. So in essence, the order of the world depended on the priest's faithfulness to their tasks. So if God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, is that if he's perfectly righteous and perfectly just, who is Job to petition him? If Job truly understands the greatness of God, then how could he possibly think he has any right or position to you know, come and bother him to act on his behalf? And so this is a question that we see Job asking in the last part of chapter 9. This is verse 14. How then can I answer him and choose my words before him? For though I were right, I could not answer. I would have to implore the mercy of my judge. In this, Job is pointing out that even if he were righteous, how can he possibly stand before God? Verse 16. If I called and he answered me, I could not believe that he was listening to my voice. So at this point, Job has begun to look out of himself and outside and look to God and recognizing this greatness and this glorious God, but he still feels separate and unworthy, right? And so how could this great God listen to him? And so God, who is above all the other pantheons of God, who is above all the powers of the earth, like, what would he want to say to Job of us? Like, even though Job were, were the greatest in his area, Job still realizes his insignificance. And so this is a place where God's story begins. And so remember, the book of Job was written before Genesis, right? Before God's inspired account of creation was given, where we are told that man was created in the image of God, and that we've been given authority to be God's representatives here on earth. You know, Job is saying, who is man that God is mindful of? Him? That's the question, right? And so... The answer is, you're a representative God of God himself. That is who you are. That is why you are, have values, because we are made in the image of God. And the story of the Bible is one of God's plan to bridge this great gulf that Job describes here in chapter 9. And it takes time for God to reveal that plan. And so God shows his love and faithfulness over and over until it comes to a point that rather than Job's claim in verse 16, that even if he called and God answered, he couldn't believe such an extraordinary thing that God would actually listen. The prophet Micah says confidently, my God hears me. So we go from Job to, I couldn't even believe God would listen. And God tells the story. He introduces himself to his people. He proves himself faithful until his people can believe that he not only hears and he listens, but he will answer. Let's go on to verse 17. 
for he bruises me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not allow me to get my breath, but saturates me with bitterness. So there's an interesting note in the Net Bible on the word for bruise. So it's actually the same word that's used in Genesis 3:15 when it's talking about the wounding of the serpent. And so Genesis sets the stage for this cosmic struggle and this battle between good and evil. And in the middle of that battle, in the middle of this tempest, there's fallout, isn't there? And we saw in chapter one that the reason all these calamities hit Job is because God was hold, withholding his protection. And so Satan was allowed to um, cause all these calamities. So Job's trials have been unrelenting, and we see here that Job's perspective is, has begun to change, but he's still feeling overwhelmed. So this is in verse 19. If there is a matter of power, behold, he is a strong one. And if it is a matter of justice, who can summon him? Though I am righteous, my mouth will condemn me. Though I am guiltless, he will declare me guilty. So Job is saying in this is that there's no one greater to appeal to than God. And he can do nothing other than to throw himself on God's mercy. And the line, though I am righteous, my mouth will condemn me, reminds me of the scene at the end of Till We Have Sick Faces by C.S. Lewis. And Oral stands in, is, stands in front of the gods and with the intent to condemn them for the ways that she feels that they have wronged her. And as she hears herself speak, and the words coming out of her mouth, she realizes that she's the one that's been in the wrong. And this is what she realizes in her complaint has been, what's the answer? Her own words condemn her. That's what Job is saying here. And so while Job is not expound on this, you know, there's a little bit of a hint of the reflection of David when he, that you know, we aren't even aware of our sins. And when David wrote uh, that, uh, God, keep me from lying to myself. Give me the privilege of knowing your instructions. It says Psalms 119, 19. And Paul notes the same thing in 1 Corinthians when he writes, My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges. And that is from 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So let's go back to Job. Verse 21. I'm guiltless. I do not take notice of myself. I despise my life. It is all one. Therefore, I say, he destroys the guiltless and the wicked. So Job is not seeing, you know, he's not seeing the end here. He's just thinking, you know what, I've tried to do my best to serve God, and look what happened to me. I don't, he's not seeing any, um, that there's any benefit right now, right? But this, the thing is, the story isn't the end. And so, you know, the thing is, if, if, if there is no justice, if there's no final recompense, no good end, then what hope is there? There isn't any. There isn't any. If this is all there is, then there's no reason to hope. And so, you know, if we don't have a good to look forward to, a justice that's above and beyond this world, then there really is no point, is there? So let's go down to verse 23. If the scourge kills suddenly, he mocks the despair of the innocent. The earth is given into the hands of the wicked. He covers the face of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? So the New American Standard translates verse 24, the earth is given into the hands of the wicked. Young's literal translation is more specific. It's not a general wicked. It is a specific wicked one. And what we saw in chapter 1 is Job is actually right about this, right? He was given into the hand of the wicked one. And this is similar to Jesus' prayer for protection from the evil one in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. So where is man's hope if, if God will not help? Now I'm going to link to some commentary on Matthew 6. Um, some translations translated as deliver us from evil. Um, there's commentary that's like this, the context is, and the phrasing is, you know, that the evil one is a, a better translation. It's about a specific being versus general abstract evil. Verse 25, Now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away and they see no good. They slip like reed boats, like an eagle that swoops in on its prey. There Job is reflecting on the transitory nature of life as being. Verse 27, Though I say, I will forget my complaint. I will leave off my sad countenance and be cheerful. I am afraid all my pains, and I know you will not acquit me. 
In the face of great grief, sometimes people will go for the path of escape and distraction. They, rather than examining their situation, they just want to do anything to escape the pain. But Job knows that if he tries to push it under the rug and act like everything is fine, it's not going to help his situation. Whatever the issue is that brought him to this point, he'll still be, still be the issue if he doesn't acknowledge it. Verse 29, I am accounted wicked. Why then should I toil in vain? If I should wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you would plunge me into the pit, and my own clothes would abhor me. Job recognizes that there is nothing that he can do on his own to, or through his own power, to make himself right with God. Verse 32, For he is not a man, as I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. There is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. And I think this is the, the whole message of this chapter. It's like the greater the God, so we need a great God, right? The world is such a mess. There's so much coming against us. We need a great, big God to help us. But the greater the God, the bigger the gulf between us and God. That's the problem, isn't it? Job knows that he serves a magnificent God, and so he fully recognizes his problem. He knows that he has no standing and no right relationship with God. And just think about how far the gulf had grown from the time when Adam and Eve walked daily in the garden with God in communion and fellowship to Job where he doesn't even think God cares or will listen, right? Such a difference. And this is the same way that the leaders of Israel felt when they were invited for a fellowship meal with God in Mount Sinai. We have a Bible study video on this, on the reasons for Easter and all to that. They came into the presence of God and had communion with him. They saw God face to face. But it was too much. After they left, the God spread. It was too much for them to handle. They were overwhelmed. They told Moses that to speak to God for them. And they, didn't, they didn't want to hear it. And here we see Job is also looking for a mediator. He realizes how great God is. And that it's just, um, it's overwhelming. Verse 34, let him remove his rod from me, and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but I am not like that in myself. So the sphere of judgment is what is keeping Job from fellowship with God, and he just doesn't see a way out. And though Job doesn't know it yet, help is on the way. God's plan is in process. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that the full answer was revealed. But even when Job is saying this, God's plan was already in process. He was, God was working circumstances to bring about Job's request. He wanted to be able to, to speak to God, to go to him as, to, as, a, as a friend, someone that he could count on real life because he realizes that there's just in his iniquity, in his sin, he can't do that. So this is in Hebrews chapter 4. This is what the answer is, right? Verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So this is what Job was looking for, this confidence to come into the throne of grace. And this is what Jesus brought, right? A way to be in that communion and fellowship and to be able to come with confidence to God. So as we're ending this, just keep in mind that Whatever your circumstances are today, that you do have that great high priest that is interceding on your behalf. And that God's plan for you is a process. You may not see that good end yet, but just like Job, that good end is coming. So let's just end this time with a prayer. 
Lord, I thank you so much for the same for this time. Lord, I thank you that you are a good God and that you do work all things according to the good of those who are called by your name, that you have good plans for us. And we trust in you, Lord. Give us true faith, that trust that commits. For the great favor was in the God over these truth listens in Jesus' name. Okay, well, thanks for joining me, and this, if you found this video encouraging or helpful, um, share it with a friend and someone else you think might enjoy it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.